Hey all, we're taking a look at chapter four in the auto textbook right now. Um, keep in mind that this is a lot of stuff that we've seen before and auto is basically building up uh, the content um, throughout the, the textbook. Um, but basically in this, we're looking at, um, you know, in, in chapter one, auto looks at the big five. We look at phonological, semantic, syntactic, morphemic, and pragmatic, um, and how those apply to uh, language development and language acquisition. Chapter 2, Otto builds on that by looking at theoretical perspectives and how these pieces impact development and acquisition of language. Chapter 3, they look at English language learners and second language acquisition and what happens when students are you know, coming in and learning English as a second language or they are adding one language on top of another. And then Chapter 4, we're taking a look at what all this means um, in infancy and toddlerhood. So what does this actually look like? Um, and what I said in class is that we're basically operationalizing, or at least auto is, in chapter four. Uh, so we did the assignment in class looking at schema and how we develop schema and trying to make sense of it. Um, when we get into communication and we think about language development, there are numerous interaction patterns. There are numerous ways that our students interact um, you know, we have eye contact, we have shared reference points, and, you know, we should have a communication loop between child and, you know, student and student, or student and adult. Um, we need to make sure that we focus on meaningful, uh, I mean, meaning in early interactions when we work with children. Uh, the, the role of dialogue, uh, this is something that we'll look at in some of our assignments, the role of dialogue, um, and turn taking and interaction as students work uh, you know, to, to discuss content, um, how important it is that adults respond to and interact with children, and then also critical periods within a child's life for language development and what possibly could happen if we skip um, or miss some of these periods. Um, in terms of adult responsiveness, uh, it's terribly important. Uh, we know that there's, you know, higher levels of uh, development of speech later on in a child's life uh, that correlates to uh, maternal responsiveness and how interactive um, and responsive, uh, to use the word to describe the word, uh, uh, the mother is in a relationship with the child. Um, and we also see that you know children from more responsive homes have larger vocab. So if the the child is, you know, if, if parents interact and respond with the child, then there's stronger connection to and you know acquisition of vocab. Um, and then they, these are, are, there is a much higher response rate and utterance rate from children than there are from less responsive homes. Uh, so the basic key component here is, you know, if, if parents and adults are responsive with children, it is beneficial for the child in the long run. In terms of critical development, uh, critical periods for language development, um, not only do you want children to interact with parents and adults, but you want children to interact with the environment. Um, yeah, we need to make sure that uh, language development occurs within critical periods of time because later in life they will need to use lessons learned in ang language acquisition. We'll talk in class about genie and what might happen if, if we uh, have aspects of privation and children aren't given opportunities to uh, you know, connect and, and be supported in language development. Um, but the thing that we have to always remember is that, let's say a student uh, misses or skips one of these terribly important time periods, these critical periods, that doesn't mean that they, um, you know, are automatically set up for failure for the rest of their life. There are times, you know, different learners are, operate differently. Um, there are times that they might be able to acquire mastery later after uh, these critical periods have ended. So taking a look at the, the big five again, one of the first things we want to take a look at is phonological development. Um, in infancy, uh, this is all out of the auto text, um, basically bringing forth the, the important parts, at least that I see from the text. Um, so in utero, uh, infants can... Uh, perceive sounds by the 25th week of gestation at 35 weeks. Infant's hearing is similar to an adult's. Um, so in utero, children you know, are, are in there listening and they're trying to make sense of 
or at least they're preparing their brains for the sounds that they will encounter when they enter the world. In early infancy, they can begin to perceive differences in sounds. They obviously, uh, for most children, they prefer human voice all over other sounds and they can pick that out. Um, and, and most importantly, uh, as early as four days old, they prefer their mother's voice. They can pick out human voices from other sounds, understand that the human voice is different, and then obviously give preference for uh, mommy's voice as opposed to anybody else. Uh, as we get to eight and 10 months old, students are paying particular attention to, or I should say infants are paying particular attention to uh, contrast, phoneme sound contrast that exist in the home language. So they're starting to attune their ear to these different uh, sounds um, that are occurring only in their home and paying particular attention. So if you think about it, in utero they're starting to listen to these different sound patterns, they're starting to make sense of what they'll hear as they enter the world. And within the first, you know, within the first eight to 10 months, they add on to that and they start to pay particular attention and they're able to discriminate between different phoneme sound contrasts that are in their home as opposed to, to elsewhere. Uh, in terms of their own speech development, earlier on, uh, in, they are primarily or initially reflexive, so it's a lot of crying and coughing, and that's how they express themselves, and later on it becomes uh, non-reflexive, so there's cooing or babbling. Um, you know, the, within four to six months, we start to see them babble, and they start to carry on, and that's the way they start to express themselves. Uh, we go into an echolalic babbling, which is basically they're echoing the rhythms and the phonation and the sounds of the adult's language. So they're, you know, in the last slide, we were talking about how they're, they're listening to different sound patterns and differences in, in the home. Um, you know, they start to listen to those and echo those rhythms and those sounds that they hear. Um, and then they start to, you know, develop this uh, communication pattern into something that's invented and conventional. So they, they're starting to figure out reasons and, and patterns to express themselves or starting to develop their own strategies to communicate um, and, and conduct speech with people in the house. Uh, once we enter toddlerhood, we'll see or we see evidence of specific, specific phonemes that are varying from day to day. Um, the student begins to, <laughs> the student, the child begins to become aware of sounds that he or she cannot produce. Um, so there's an awareness not only of what they can do and, and they start to enact these different phonemes and these different sounds and they also play a little bit by testing out different phonemes uh, daily. Uh, but then there's also an awareness of what they can't do. Um, awareness of sound similarities and patterns, things that are alike, uh, you know, rhyming words, rhyming patterns. Um, basically awareness of what things uh, some of the nuance of language and of speech. Um, and then also one of the things that we start to see is that, you know, we talked about these critical time periods that health problems may interfere with phonological development. Um, one of those health problems that we point out in the text and that we see uh, 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 much too frequently is ear infections. Um, you know, we have inflammation of middle ear. Um, a lot of children... Uh, experience ear infections within the first couple of years of life. So they had a statistic 85 to 90 percent uh, at least have one in one ear infection by age six. Um, second most frequent illness and the, the problem is that this is impacting a critical time when students should be you know listening and testing out different uh, speech patterns and trying to begin to master the, the language at least the, the vocalization of the language um, and so, you know, their speech can be impaired. Their hearing can also be impaired, obviously. Um, so it's something to be aware of and uh, prepare for, uh, because as it says here, I mean, it's, it's a very frequent illness that we need to be uh, cognizant of and protect our students uh, to the best of our ability, or at least address it. In terms of semantic development, as uh, infants... Uh, there is uh, early associations between speech and meaning. Um, so there are early associations between what the student, the student, the child is saying and, and what they're trying to get across in meaning. 
so there is a, a there is a reason for the cries. There is a reason for the there is the pain cry. There is the angry cry. There is a, just a basic I want attention cry. Um, so there's meaning behind, um, or the, the 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 child begins to create meaning or associations between their cries and what they're uh, feeling. Uh, there is also uh, feedback. Uh, they're starting to develop understandings. Uh, between concept and, and the reception of those concepts with other people out in the world. Uh, so what they're doing is children are learning through direct and vicarious experiences. They're learning directly from what happens or they're learning vicariously through what they see friends or family or children in the house or even on TV. Um, vicariously, they're, they're learning what happens uh, when we we interact and you know we get some sort of response uh, we the children start to develop emotional bonds they have affective experiences so they have some of these soft skills um, and then they start to as they play with speech they start to interact and form symbols and and create objects um, or an understanding of objects with the speech that they use uh, in terms of infancy we also have um, different forms of expressive knowledge, uh, expressive semantic knowledge. We have invented words uh, and idiomorphs. Um, some students, uh, children will basically have a holophrastic speech. They'll basically uh, use one word to convey a whole thought. Uh, they'll try and whittle down the English language um, into being happy or sad or mad or angry. Um, and instead of trying to bring out a whole sentence or a whole phrase and express a whole thought, they'll brace it, they'll try and lump it into one word to get that idea across. Um, and then in terms of uh, direct and indirect experiences, uh, most of this is formed by adult-child interactions. Um, in order, I mean, once again, we're talking about communication, and we need the child to. Uh, express themselves, express himself or herself, uh, and then the, the adult to interact and give some sort of response. That's one of the key components that we've seen throughout these different slides. Uh, when we move into toddlerhood and we look at semantic development, uh, we, we see that the, the receptive vocab exceeds expressive vocab uh, on, on a daily basis. We see that there are uh, children begin to understand variations uh, between themselves and also uh, we see variations in, in what children are doing. There's an interest in, in playing naming games with different caregivers. Um, and then children start to pick up vocab uh, very rapidly. They start to, you know, after a couple times working with some terms or some vocab, they pick it up very quickly, and, and they can uh, their their vocab, their lexicon increase exponentially. Um, we also have a, an understanding or insight into how uh, child speech brings clues to intended meaning. We understand that uh, you know we can start to piece together what they're trying to tell us through the the terminology, through their speech patterns. Um, the, the children at this stage also uh, in toddlerhood in terms of semantic development, they're, they're exploring their environment. They're trying to piece together what you know their, their local ecosystem is and, and how their role exists within that. Um, so how are they as a child? You know, and how should they interact in this environment? What is the role of the adult? How does the adult and the child interact in this environment? Um, so we think about semantic uh, meaning, um, you know, we're, it, semantics is basically uh, the way that we try to make sense of the world and the stories that we tell ourselves about the world uh, to try and make sense of what's happening. Um, so as children enter toddlerhood, they're starting to think about language and start to think about speech and they're thinking about the role of, you know, think about their role within this environment and also uh, the, the role of their uh, use of speech and language as a, as a key component in these interactions. In terms of syntactic development, um, you know, students in infancy, uh, 
start to pay attention to syntactic elements. They start to pay attention to the, the syntax or the, the rules of language. Um, it's not as well formed out uh, as some of the other components in the Big Five, but you know, infants start to perceive and, and process language in, in multiple word segments. Um, primarily, they're, and this is what we, we talked about a couple slides ago, they're listening to and they're attending to uh, properties of speech, primarily acoustic properties. Um, uh, infants, as they get a little bit older, they uh, use prosody, uh, basically rhythm and sound. They're listening to the, the way that adults um, you know, speak and the rhythm within their speech and the sounds that they make. Um, and then they start to try to mimic those to add meaning to their one word utterances. Um, and then once again, as the, the role of the adult in this interaction is, is hugely important. Um, in terms of patterns, once again, we talk about uh, telegraphic speech. We talk about uh, synty syntactic patterns. Uh, as children try to make sense of uh, the world. Uh, and so what we'll see is the, they will lump a word together. So um, they'll, add a, an a, they'll add an action with an object or an agent with an object. So you know they will formulate or they'll put together patterns as an utterance. So they will say, you know, play drum or mommy hat or go bed. Um, so they'll basically be lumping uh, two or three words together in an utterance, uh, trying to express exactly what it is that they're they're trying to uh, communicate. Um, also, syntactically, in, in toddlerhood, children start to acquire use of pronouns. Um, you know, they pick this up and bring this into preschool. Uh, the, we also see the uh, initial beginnings of emergent literacy. Um, and the syntactic knowledge that they'll need later on as they start to enter their formal educational experience. In terms of morphemic development, um, students in infancy, we talked earlier about how they you know, are, are paying attention to words and paying attention to phonemes. Um, in, in infancy, they're also starting to perceive distinctions with sounds um, and then thinking about inflectional mo morphemes um, and how those impact uh, the, the words that they use and the way that they use them. Um, and obviously one of the key components is also they're listening to uh, the way that others speak in their home and in the community. So we see this again and again that even at an early age, you know, our children are listening. They're trying to pay attention and understand differences and understand, um, you know, what these different component parts are and how do we formulate them. Oh, I think I missed a slide. Yeah, and so uh, one of the other things is that they're starting to understand and use, at least in toddlerhood, uh, plurality. They're thinking of, you know, plural forms of words that they would use. They're thinking about verb tense. Um, and so how can we take something and move from the present to the past or, or you know, uh, and then also possessive. So this is not uh, the ball. This is the dog's ball. Um, this is not my ball. This is you know, uh, you know the boy's ball. Um, so they're thinking about different inflectional aspects of language and how that impacts their use of the language. Uh, pragmatically, uh, they're starting to in, uh, include different gestures to communicate or accentuate their communication and, and allow others to understand intent. Uh, thinking about symbolism and, and how their use of symbols uh, and uh, intersection with symbolism and gestures uh, helps explain uh, communication and intent and meaning. Um, and then also, uh, probably most importantly, at least in my opinion, is the idea of turn-taking and, and uh, dialogue. Uh, and basically have, uh, you know, an interaction or a partnership or, you know, the, the basic building blocks of communi communication where one is sharing information with another uh, and then returning some sort of response and then maybe continuing on that discussion. Um, as they move into toddlerhood, there is continued development of different gestures, both for referential and symbolic intent. Um, 
children start to, in toddlerhood, at least in terms of pragmatic information, start to use um, for different purposes or intent. Uh, they start to have greater variety of language usage. Uh, they start to develop their own routine expressions. Um, they start to carry on conversations with adults. Um, and then there's also the, the, at least in toddlerhood, then there's uh, greater, uh, a greater role for literacy interactions with adults. So this might be book reading, uh, this might be uh, interacting around a text, this might be writing and writing related activities uh, or social or communicative activities with adults as they, tar as they start to become a greater role uh, in literacy practices in the home.